What is hatching, Toga Peeps? Tup Tup Platoon coming at you today with my very good friend and cousin. And he is... Ricochet. You can call me. Mr. Ricochet. You can follow us both on Twitter. Follow me at Tuperius, as always. And you can follow him at Ricochet... what, 82? H82. Ricochet H82. All right. Which actually and stems from a Halo reference. Halo reference. There we go. <laughs> we don't just like Pokemon. That's right. We play games. All right. And for those of you who have no idea what this is because you have never heard about it before, which is everybody, this is going to be a hopefully weekly podcast that we are going to do, not once a week, obviously, if we can, and we are calling it Competitively Casual. We are going to cover uh, majority of wise Pokemon and we are going to approach it from both angles, both the competitive and casual scene, because we both play both. That's right. We play each side of it, the coin. So. Right, and very few podcasts out there actually approach, very rarely approach Pokemon from a casual scene. And from what I've known from being on YouTube for a while, some people do actually appreciate that. So, let's go right into it. The show description, we just told you what we're going to be competitively casual. We're going to talk about competitive stuff as changes are made. We're going to talk about the casual scene as I don't know that it really changes. And so there we go. Um, for some of you who aren't familiar with the competitive scene, we will be citing sources. Most of them are going to be either... Uh, Smogan, Cerebi, Poke Beach, maybe Nugget Bridge for a few things there. But those are probably going to be our four main sources cited. Um, if you aren't familiar with those, there will be links in the descriptions to those websites. Um, what they are is Smogan is pretty much the end-all, be-all of who designs the competitive landscape and your metagame. Uh, Cerebi is just a news and information. The same with Poke Beach. Poke Beach covers a lot more of the TCG, which we probably really won't get into very much. But they do unless have. Unless you want us to. Yeah, unless you want us to, because I have recently played and we're both uh, collectors. So those will be the sources. So let's dive right into X and Y. Me and uh, Ricochet have both played. Every Pokemon game there is, all the way back from uh, Red and Blue when we were, oh shit, probably what, like 12 years old? Somewhere around there. Yeah, I think that's close to when it came out, so... So we were know. just a rung below teenagers when this started. And um, so, let's jump right into it. Mr. Ricochet, what are some of your initial feelings when you first started playing Pokemon X and Y? Uh, very excited so to see how far it's come. Um, initially, when you first uh, jump into the game, it just stands out. 3D models, the char- you know, the battles, everything just stood out from that 3D standpoint. Uh, it's pretty much what fans have been clamoring for uh, for years and years. Make that move into 3D. Make that move into 3D, and. Uh, I, from a technological standpoint of the 3DS and everything, I felt that they did an excellent job with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm waiting to see what comes next, as, as obviously we've we've put plenty of time into X and Y by now, so I'm waiting to see what their next announcements are. But uh, just initially jumping into the game, it just it stands out. So 3D models, 3D everything, landscapes. Um, it really takes you back to to how you felt when you first played blue, you know, red and blue, or blue and green for those in Japan, or you know, some some people started with yellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it really takes you back to to how you initially feel. You're starting this big adventure, but but it's not. I don't want to say it's not overwhelming. Uh, as as a fan, you just can't you know can't believe how far it's come. Right. Well, it's something I experienced when I first started was something that I haven't had for a long time playing Pokemon games, 
And that was that excitement to play the game again. It was wa- wanting to go fight through the wilderness to get to the next gym because you don't want to put the game down. You don't want to stop playing. And that's something I found was very lacking in the fifth gen. Very much so. But I think they did a really good job. Um, I thought the storyline was very fluent and also kind of helped you scoot along through the game. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't going to bring up the storyline too much because the uh, the whole team flair aspect and everything. I don't think that was at all necessary. I think well, they could have. I think they could have really put together the game without even having a, a, a bad guy team. Obviously, they're going to have a bad guy team. Right. Um, that's how you go after the legendaries, which we'll get into a little later. But uh, well, I just mean, um, team team flair in general, they just I don't they they lacked what I have felt other teams, and, and honestly, I, I feel uh, since Hoenn. Uh, all teams have lacked what what like uh, Team Rocket and, and, and Team Aqua, Team Magma really set out to do. Right. Um, yeah, I, I just same, you know, almost like a generic knockoff. Like, just and, and, and the stakes keep getting higher and higher, you know. Right. But the teams are all jokes. <laughs> right. So, but uh, no, story wise and everything, it kept you moving right along, and. Uh, just really, fa- I mean, I mean, like, like you said, it just you didn't want to stop playing, and, mm-hmm. and that was my. I mean, I know I picked mine up at midnight, and literally I didn't go to sleep until the following night, probably around midnight. So I, I probably put, a, you know, sitting there next to an outlet with the power cord plugged in, probably a good twenty four hours into my game before I stopped playing it. Uh, due to sleep <laughs> due right to lack of sleep so like like you said um just that want to keep playing just to see what's next mm-hmm. um and, and i don't want to say that they made the game easier um uh, obviously they wanted it to be a good starting point um for newcomers to the to the series and everything right um so, but it still just had enough in it where where us vets, us, us people that have been playing it, you know, since the very beginning, just wanted to keep going and keep going. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I guess story wise, uh, I didn't think it drove the game as much, um, but it, it 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 definitely you didn't want to stop playing. So right. it did a good job of making you wanting to continue. Something I liked about this game that I didn't like about Black and White and Black and White 2 was there weren't too many unnecessary side quests that you had to complete. Mm-hmm. That's With Black and White 2, I constantly found myself doing like that stupid freaking whatever the hell the Pokemon Hollywood was. Yeah, that was the, very unnecessary and very early in the game. Yeah, I seriously wanted to kill somebody. myself. I, I, uh, you had to make that dude happy enough to come back and direct a movie. What the hell was that even about? Um, I, honestly, uh, I hit buttons. I hit the A button pretty much all the way through that. So Yeah, I stopped playing my game for a month when that happened. I was so upset. Which I believe. So uh, Talking about black and white real quick, um, <laughs> I just picked up black, or I just picked up white too again. Uh, to try and finish that <laughs> yeah. for whenever Pokemon Bank comes out, and that's something else we'll talk about here in a few. Yeah. But um, another thing that – something that they changed a lot with X and Y, they tinkered a bit more, in my opinion, than they have in previous generation with some of what people would expect to be the set game mechanics. And I'm going to use that term generically – because, I mean, so many things changed. So many Pokemon moves are a different power now or have a different accuracy rating. Absolutely. And it's – not only is it confusing as hell because so much of it changed. I'm still trying to figure out which moves that I haven't used yet competitively battling have changed. Yeah. There, there's several moves that have gone up in power and, and others that have been dropped, so – Oh, yeah, God, did they butt-fuck freaking Hidden Power. Oh, yeah. 
60% power? Are you kidding me? That was the bread and butter of so many Pokemon sets that are just pathetic now. Yeah, they said... I don't want to. I, I don't like using the, the name or the word nerf because uh, it, it's a change that they make in the same game. Um, whereas this is, is a different generation of the game. So, but but they really did. They 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 knocked the power levels down. Yeah, they um, killed it. That. Well, that's so many unnecessary boosts to moves that I mean, good lord, knock off. That's such a good move now. They bumped the power on that up. So not only do you knock off the item, but you ha you're doing decent damage now. Yeah, knock. Yeah. Yeah, knock off. Um, what was the other one too re the, that I just saw recently? There were there were several moves. Yeah, but I mean, th this is more drastic in my opinion than last generation when they bumped the amount of turns taunt went into effect. Yeah. That, I mean, I could remember that just killing half of the sets I had on Pokemon because Taunt was supposed to be five moves and it went down to three. And that just sucked. But uh, another huge, especially metagame changing effect was them just destroying weather teams. Yeah. By make what is it, five turns? It's five turns now for, well, I mean, for any weather, unless you have one of the rocks. Right. Which extends it out to seven turns. But, I mean, a lot of the Pokemon that are in weather t teams are frequently put to the front of the... on the battle lines anyways, especially Politoed and Tyranitar. Right. But, oh man, it just ruined their day. I mean, you really have to watch your weather inducer now when you're battling if you want to keep your, your weather up. Uh, on a competitive front, you don't see a lot of teams now that, that use the weather effects because of how bad they nerfed it. Right. Well, that, that should make all the nerds happy because so many people were clamoring about how terrible it was that weather teams were just destroying the metagame. But the, only, the only thing I have to say about that is uh, create a team to counter it. So yeah. that, that that's the competitive standpoint of the game, I guess. <laughs> well, easier easier said than done with the weather, easier said than done with the weather teams last gen, because it was just there was no there was no counter you could put out for them. I mean, yeah, you you got a team that's going to destroy rain teams. Well, then you got a sandstorm team and you're screwed. Right, right. Well, that's also part of the competitive aspect of the game. Multiple oh, right, teams. right, Multiple absolutely. Teams you have. So many different Pokemon, you know. Don't don't pick six and, and say that's your team. You, you got to really go deep and, and you know. I, I will honestly say I, I can pick a team of twelve to eighteen different Pokemon that I would right. use at, at any point in a competitive battle. So it's just right. a matter of knowing what you want to do with them. All right. I used to have boxes upon boxes when I was hardcore into battling, and it was hard to put a team together because I had so many to choose from. Right. But, yep. So, anything else in X and Y that stood out to you right away? Um, breeding mechanics. Yes. <laughs> they definitely made breeding so much more enjoyable. Yes. Um, both to give it that competitive edge. Um, as far as breeding goes, they, they made it so that you can get that competitive Pokemon easier now. It's no yes. longer, you know, with the EV training, um, I, I there's two different ways to do it now. Um, the main uh, main way is, is horde battling. That's where you'll get most of your, your EVs from. Um, but also, too, they made it easier with the, with the super training mechanic. Right. That way you can actually see visually where your EVs are going into. Right, but well, even though the, the, the super training mechanic takes much longer, I find it is almost worth it because whenever I'm horde battling, I always get that oddball Pokemon that completely skews what I'm going for, and I have to reset my evs and start over. Yeah, I mean, that's if you enter into a horde that has two different types. Right. 
or, or two different Pokemon in it. Uh, for for example, so Viper and, and Zangoose mm-hmm. normally appear together in a horde. Um, so I mean, normally you could skip out of those bouts and stuff. Um, so it's just a matter, of, like like I said, uh, you, you get more EVs out of the horde battles than you do, and like you said, it does take longer with the super training. Mm-hmm. Um, I have found though. Um, using just the super training for EV that the Pokemon don't gain as much experience as if you were to go out into a horde battle. And by what what I mean there is like, uh, for example, uh, I have an Azumarill. Uh, Azumarill, one of my favorite Pokemon is Gen 2. Um, Huge power. It is massive on an adamant nature with him. And I found that using only the super training and only do, only doing attack from from his levels only doing the attack stat uh it didn't like go as high as as uh for example I have a venusaur that uh has high hit points and high defense mm. I I strictly just to put this theory to the test I strictly did super training with Azumarill and I strictly did horde battles with the venusaur and the Venusaur actually, when you look at his his chart on the super training, um, it goes well into the word uh, of, of HP and well into the word of, of uh, defense or DEF mm-hmm. uh, in the super training. Um, whereas on the attack for my Azumarill using just the super training, it goes into the word, but it's not as, as steep a... Uh, it doesn't extend as far out as it did with the Venusaur, so... Well, I think some of that has to do with it reflecting the actual base stats of the Pokemon. It, I, that could be, so that, that would be a whole other topic to get into. Um, right. But no, getting back to it, the breeding mechanics. I, that, as, yeah. I, I like breeding in, in just about every Pokemon game. Um, I hated it in black and white. Yeah. Um, and, and I wasn't too fond of it in, uh, in, in Diamond, Pearl, or Platinum either. Um, last time I really competitively bred, uh, for Pokemon, uh, you know this as well as I, um, back, uh, in 2006 with Pokemon Emerald. Right. Uh, getting ready for the Journey Across America tour. If you competed in that, congratulations, you were awesome in our book. Um, <laughs> because we competed in that. Some and, of our uh, viewers might not have been old enough to compete in that tournament. Some of our viewers probably <laughs> probably weren't old enough to compete in that tournament. Um, so, but hey, uh, we've got the t-shirts to commemorate it. I know you got a pretty kick-ass guide there. So, yep. um, we I know we spent months and, and hundreds of hours getting our teams ready. It was so hard to get to level 100 in that game. It very much was, yes. And we're getting off, way off topic again. So we back, really are. <laughs> back, to, back to breeding. They made, especially with the Friend Safari, guarantee, I mean, granted, if you can get the Pokemon you want out of Friend Safari that you're trying to breed, guaranteed two perfect IVs. And for those of you who don't know, IVs stand for individual values. They rate on a chart of 0 to 31, 31 being a perfect IV, and you'll hear us refer to them as IVs. Um, but what it is is it's a, a it goes by every stat, hit points, attack, defense, special attack, special defense, and speed. Each one has one of those numbers that plugs in with it. And if you hear somebody talk about breeding out a, say, Quint Ive Perfect or a Perfect Ive Pokemon, what they're trying to accomplish is get 531 Ives in all the stats they want them to be critical because they are a boost just like your uh, effort value training or the, the EV training. Basically, this is what makes my Azumarill kill your Azumarill. Right. (laughs) <laughs> Granted, it's only 31 points, but it could be the 31 points that make you that little bit much better than your competitor. And those who are a little bit more competitive about it breed this way. Those of you who casually breed, you don't give a crap, and this really doesn't apply to you. But 
with the the friend safari, you are guaranteed two perfect eyes in any in Random any of the stat. stats, right? Yeah. On any Pokemon you catch from the friend safari, and that just makes it so much easier to breed because you put two of those together that have two diff or four different perfect eyes. That's that much closer and easier it is for you to get to your goal of breeding a uh, perfect ived or quint ived pokemon and see part part of, of what makes breeding so much more enjoyable on the competitive front now is that we're able to see these ives mm -hmm. and and by see them i mean there is a way that you can go and, and check them um that way being going to the pokemon center in what is it, K uh, Kalade City? Yeah, however you say, I was going to say Kilyud. Kilyud City. Um, so it's, yeah, it, yeah uh, it's down where the Friends Safari is. So I mean, you can catch them and go right to the Poke Center and catch. Right, right. You can catch them. Uh, it's in the same town as, as the Friends Safari. Right. But you can you can go to that Pokemon Center. Check the uh, the dude standing there in like a uh, purple and black suit. He's got purple hair. He's up by uh, the dressing room. Yeah, he's basically, up to the you, left. Yeah, basically you talk to him, and, and he he will tell you what uh, what your Pokemon is. Where, where you know, for instance, I'll, I'll walk up to him, and he'll tell me my Kolava has nice special attack and nice speed. Right. You know, just as an example. Um, so, and you know that those two specific stats are thirty-one IV'd. Right, there's special wording if you pay attention to the way he talks. If he says, those kind of stats are fantastic, they can't be beat, that means that they are a perfect 31. Anything else he says about those stats, that just means that they are the highest Ives that it, you have on the Pokemon. Right. So I learned that the hard way after I bred out a Pokemon, and he said, oh, those, these, this is your Pokemon's highest Ives. And I'm like, oh, fantastic. That's exactly what I want. Then one of my friends is like, no, he has to say this. And I was like, balls. Yeah. Had to start over. I know uh, I, I know. I had to actually look at Cerebi in, in their uh, their breeding decks to see what each, uh, what each one meant as far as the high IVs go. So. Yeah, there's a series of phrases that he says to you, each meaning different. What different, moves, yeah. Yeah. So, but that that is probably that is probably the most joyous um, for me, anyways. That is probably the most joyous aspect that they've uh, done to the game is the breeding mechanics. Right. Well, while we're talking about breeding, let's not forget to mention the two most awesome items for breeding now, with the Destiny Knot and the Everstone. Absolutely. Or yeah, the Everstone. Yeah. Yeah, Everstone passes down the nature, nature from whichever parent. It doesn't matter if it's male or female now. Which it right. passes down the nature from whichever parent. And it's a hundred percent guaranteed. In the past games, it wasn't a hundred percent. Absolutely. And then and also the destiny not passes down between the two parents, which could have a total of twelve perfect IVs, mm -hmm. guarantees to pass down at least five of them, which right. is huge because it never did that before. Right, and just a small clarificational note, it does not always pass down the perfect ones. Right, it, it doesn't randomly guarantee. Selects five. Right, it doesn't guarantee that that, you know, unless both parents have the same Ives. Right. It, it's not going to guarantee, you know, you might get one, you know, one parent might, might not have perfect Ives in the special attack, but one parent might. Well, the offspring may or may not get that IV. So, it, I mean, it's random, but you get at least five if right. if your parent if the parent Pokemon have five different IVs between them. So, which again, that's that's huge. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Anything else from X and Y you'd like to bring up before we move on? Um. I'll, I'll say something real quick about how amazing Wonder Trade is. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I I like uh, I, I could spend hours just plopping random Pokemon onto Wonder Trade, 
just to see what I get back. You know, sometimes, you know, a, a lot of the time, like if I'm bre- mass breeding something, uh, any extras, you know, I'll put out there. Uh, I did this with EVs. I did this with some Cyndaquils recently. Um, just mass bred. Doesn't matter, you know, IVs and, and, and whatnot. Sometimes you get some awesome Pokemon with some awesome IVs off of it. Sometimes right. you get Fletchling. So it's just the luck hey, of the draw. There is nothing wrong with Fletchling. I'm tired of seeing Fletchling on, on Wonder Trade. Uh, Would you that, prefer... That and Magikarp. Those, those Magikarp. Two, you know, <laughs> yeah, I can't Magikarp. Stand, <laughs> I can't stand seeing either of them. I, see, but, I wouldn't uh, mind the Magikarps if I got someone with some decent eyes past. I mean, if I had got one, at least one with three perfect eyes, I'd be like, okay, I can handle that. But I always get the freaking dropout, dunce cap freaking Magikarps. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Fletchling. Just about just about every other trade on Wonder Trade, it seems anymore, is a Fletchling. Adamant Nature, which is perfect for it, and Big Pex, which is is probably the ability, the hidden ability that you want uh, for him. Oh, but, now you um, see, I would go. What the hell is it called? Gale Wing or whatever the heck it is, which gives flying type. Oh no, Gale priority. Wing, no, Gale, no, no, no. You're right. Gale Wing is the hidden ability. Oh, okay. And, and that's 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 the one that you that you would want. Yeah. Right. So I'm sorry. That's most of everything, you know. Yeah, you were right. I do keep getting effects. big peck ones. Yeah, I get big peck a, a lot. So, but no, Gale Wing is definitely the one that you, as far as the hidden ability goes. So, yeah. but uh, no, it, it's an addicting little thing. It, it means that, uh, you know, I've got probably four or five boxes in game mm-hmm. of just random garbage Pokemon, and I don't want to say garbage Pokemon, but just random Pokemon that. Just just random Pokemon. Yeah, the sad that thing I've is... gotten off of Wonder Trade, you know. I've also got probably I've probably also got four or five boxes of, of excellent Pokemon that I've gotten off of Wonder Trade. Right. I just got a, a female me uh, meow stick the other day off of Wonder Trade. Five perfect IVs. Nice. Uh, it's like level fifty seven or something ridiculous like that, and it has a killer move set. <laughs> I, I was I was psyched to see. I mean, it had it had a uh, Psychic, it had Signal Beam, uh, I think it had Thunderbolt, and it had something else on it. Just just a wide range of moves for, for its type. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Speed Up Attack, I think it was Timid, Speed Up Attack Down, which is, you know, make it faster and it hits hard with Special Attack already as is. So, mm-hmm. that's uh, when I got that thing, I was like, oh my god, that's five IVs? Uh, everything except for hit points, I believe. Mm-hmm. So I, I was I was super stoked to get that fine. So, but then, you know, occasionally you get the gems off Wonder Trade, but and occasionally you don't. Um, I, I know I've gotten quite a few Larvestas off of Wonder Trade recently. Mm. I don't know if somebody went on a mass breeding spree of those, but uh, I got some that had good IVs, some that didn't. So I was very you know Wonder Trade is just a, a fun addictive experience. Um, it keeps the community fresh. It, it allows you to do something with the community that you couldn't do in previous games, mm-hmm. uh, which is just you know random trading. So uh, I, I enjoy that part of it. You know, I, I enjoy Wonder Trade now. Um, like I said, it's just a, a perfect way to, to get the community involved with one another. So, what is the best thing that you have gotten off of Wonder Trade? Oh, oh, you're you're putting me on the spot here. Okay, while you think about it, I'll tell <laughs> you what I'll tell you what mine is because I know what mine was and I I'm waiting to ev it and use it. Okay. And it, it was the first day I was on Wonder Trade 2. I got a timid Quint Perfect uh Zora. Oh wow. Oh yeah, I was like you have got to be kidding me. And I just what's like the, oh, uh, what's the nature on it? Timid Oh, you, know, you, you said that. Sorry. Yeah, it's perfect. It's exactly what I need <laughs> yeah. to. It's what I need to use. All I have to do is raise it. And I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" I felt bad because I traded it some shit Pokemon. I was like, "Oh man!" But that was by far the best thing. I, I've pulled a couple off of there that were obvious breed rejects because I mean, just like you said, I put my breed rejects out there too. I flooded freaking. Wonder Trade with uh, 
Meryl is named Pika Blue. Nice. Well, that's, nice. I love kind me, of lo- and, and you know me too. All the, all the way since Gen Two, man. Love me some Meryl. Yep. Well, that's you traded me the one. I used it to breed with another one that I had, and that's what the offspring went on Wonder Trade. But I mean, like you said, it seems fairly common that people put their trade re- or breed rejects out there as just an attempt to what another thing that I enjoy about Wonder Trade is my God does it help you fill up your Pokedex. Absolutely. You just Absolutely. get the shit that you don't see every day and some and, of the stuff and, that you and, can't get. And to that level too, the GTS. Right. Um, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, but the GTS also that's I, I just went on a, a spree last night where I literally went out just searching for Pokemon that I've seen in my decks but I don't actually have yet. Mm-hmm. And and I got quite a few of them just off of random trades. Yeah. So but yeah, absolutely. It'll it'll help you fill up your decks quick probably quicker than anything else. Um until you start seeing, like I said, the fletchlings over and over again and uh another one I've been seeing a lot lately has been Vulpix. Mm. So I've got uh Five or six bull picks in my boxes right now. Uh, you see, the the thing that I've seen the most that I've gotten from trades is freaking Eevee. I swear I must have 50 Eevee in my boxes just from putting stuff out there. I've but, seen a bunch yeah. of Eevee as I've seen a bunch of Eevee as well. I can proudly say that I have one of each Eevee evolution with the correct nature for each Eevee evolution. Mm-hmm. So breeding now is no longer an issue. It's just a matter of, of which one I want to throw in the box to get the perfect IVs on. And I've got right. a couple of EVs with some perfect IVs as well. Uh, I've, I've got a 5 IV, everything but hit points. I've got one that has everything but defense. So, you know, put those two in a box together, have them make sweet babies, and then, right. bam, I've got a bunch of perfect IV Pokemon. Right. So that's e- EV has become easy to me. So I, I've moved off of EV for a little bit. Mm. Um, just because I have so many EVs that that have perfect IVs, um, so the, the I don't really have a project I'm working on as far as breeding goes right now. Mm. I have a breeding project currently, which we'll talk more about later in the show because it ties in with another feature we'll be doing later. Okay. So I don't think you ever said what's the best thing you've pulled off a of Wonder Trade. Uh, let's see here. I've got two best things actually. I'm going to stick okay. with that me- that that meow stick I got that female meow stick. Okay. Uh, probably the best IV'd Pokemon and, and and best trained Pokemon, and I could use that Pokemon for breeding later as well. Um, the other thing I got um, just last night actually, um, give you know get, get ready to wipe you know put put on the the pampers here. Right. I got a shiny Floatzel. Oh no shit. Yeah, shiny floats of last night off of Wonder Trade. So it was probably about eleven thirty last night. Everything I could, everything I could do to not wake up the entire household. Yeah. When I saw this thing uh, pop up, and I think I traded one of the random Magic Carps that got traded to me yesterday for this thing. Uh. So that person is probably pissed off right now that he got a Magic Carp for a shiny floats. And I don't even know if he wanted to put this floats out on Wonder Trade, but it's mine now, so it doesn't matter. Right. It is a level 30. It's only a gentle nature, which isn't, you know, the best of natures for him. Right. Um, That's a shiny Pokemon. It, yeah, it's, it's a shiny. So I think that gentle's what? Special defense up, defense down, I think. I have no clue. I don't think I've ever used a gentle nature. As far as competitively goes, I don't think I've used it other than maybe in-game for casual play. Oh, right. So, which this thing will be used for. <laughs> so <laughs> I will so if, if I've got a shiny... In game, and I'm playing just playing casually. I will put the, th- this thing in my party, mm-hmm. you know, if it's not a good nature. I don't care. Um, I, I know we we talked earlier about this um, off of the GTS. I got that. Uh, what is that? That Dragolage or whatever Draglage. Yeah. The, the evolved form of, of Screlp. Um, the way the I've heard it pronounced is Dragalgy because. Scroll oh, gee, yeah, yeah, I, I can see that, yeah. But see, yeah, Lord actually, only knows. Yeah, I've not actually heard the pronunciation of it yet, so uh, until then we'll just butcher it. All um, right. <laughs> Somebody's going to tell us we say it wrong anyways, trust me. 
I hope so. So. Like, you guys suck. You don't know how to talk your Pokemons. Oh, trust me. I've been talking Pokemons longer than you've probably been off your mother's titties. Leave it alone. Oh, oh trust me, dude. <laughs> you should see <laughs> we'll some see of the it. people telling me, oh, especially, especially freaking Caesar. Someone will tell you you say that wrong no matter how you say it. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like, no, it's You hear scissor. Teasor, like, no. you hear Skeezor, you hear, I mean, you, you hear every, everything when it comes to him, so. Right. But. Which I, I, I like Skeezor, too, so, Caesar. Right. Uh, so, anything else here? So, we talked about Wonder Trade, which is a fun addition. We've talked about the breeding mechanics. Is there anything uh, that, that you like that's different out of uh, X and Y that we haven't gotten before? Uh. Well, we pretty much covered everything that I thought about talking about today. Um, one thing that I'm kind of on the fence about that is new with X and Y is the Mega Evolutions. And uh, while I like them and they're kind of cool, in my opinion, they're kind of not. And I like how it changes the game. I do. I, I And I like how it changes some Pokemon. And how it makes them unique and dynamic, like freaking Mega Kangaskhan. Oh, that, yeah. The way they changed Kangaskhan into Mega Kangaskhan was amazing, and I love it. But at the same time, there's some other Pokemon well, where all they did was, instead of making actual new Pokemon, which the freaking game needed, that's one thing I don't like about X and Y, is the lack of depth in the Pokedex edition they made. Yeah, when you look at... Uh... Like, if you check out, for instance, Cerebi, and you go to their XY Pokedex, you, they have it divided by each region. Kanto, Johto, uh, Hoenn, Sinnoh, yeah. uh, Unova, and, and Kalos. When you click on the Kalos part of the decks, um, it only brings up, like, what, 60, 70 Pokemon, which is the fewest number of Pokemon that they've put out in any game. Right, and, uh, and which, half of them are Mega Evolutions. Yeah, yeah. there's a good chunk of them that are now Mega Evolutions. And uh -huh. it's just, to me, um, while it changes the game to an extent, I don't want to say it changes the game, so, for instance, Mega Blaziken, which you could only have gotten if you uh, did, did the... Uh, the mystery gift Wi-Fi. The mystery event. gift over the Wi-Fi, right? Um, which is over now. Which is over now. So don't be trying to jump on if you're listening, uh, because they they no longer have it available. But um, if you use just Blaziken, he is actually more, uh, more powerful than Mega Blaziken. The difference is is that they bumped up because Speed Boost is going to jack your speed up no matter what. Right. You're going to be faster than anything else out there. And that's why, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they ban Mega Blaziken or, or Blaziken with uh, Speed Boost in general? Yes. In 5th in Gen, when Blaziken was released with the Speed Boost hidden ability, it was almost immediately banned. And, and competitively speaking now, Smogan banned it. it. I don't even think it made it through one round of testing. It was like, okay... Well, it got just, high... It's so overpowering with speed boost, but the Mega Blaziken is actually less powerful with its physical attack than a regular Blaziken is, say, holding Life Orb or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mega Blaziken actually benefits mostly from a defensive standpoint. It, it buffs up its defenses some, so mm -hmm. it's able to take more hits. Um so just stuff like that, you know, little changes like that, you know, was it, it's cool to look at. Yes. Um, on a competitive standpoint, you don't always want to use it unless you're, you know, like you said, Kangaskhan beast mode. So and getting able that, to get able, that, be, being able to double hit anything with any right. move is, is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's banned already now too. Yeah. I think it got banned too. Um, I know he was destroying ghost types and psychic types with that sucker punch. Oh, yeah. Well, double fake out, and then double sucker punch. Screwed. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have Scrappy. Mm -hmm. Screwed. It Which hits everything. is the perfect nature you want for, for right. Kangaskhan, Mega Kangaskhan. Right. They're, they're fun to use in-game because, you know, on the casual front, it doesn't matter what the nature is. 
Um, they're they're fun to use just because normally you you're gonna overpower your opponent. Right. There weren't too many points in the game where I didn't hit that mega evolution button, and I didn't KO that opponent quite quickly after that. All right. Um, the, the champion I think might have been the only case where I hit my mega evolution and then she hit hers and withstood what I did, so I had to hit her again. Mm -hmm. So it was still a two-hit KO, but still, that you know, on, on a casual point, the Mega Evolutions are fun. Uh, they're fun to look at. It's fun to run around between 8 o'clock at night and 9 o'clock at night trying to collect all the stones. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't care specifically for the time, but, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Right. Here's a question I have not been able to get an answer to for you. I don't know if you know or not. Are you able to trade the Mega Stones between games? Um, you have to be able to, because why else? I mean, don't quote me on it, because I haven't actually done it yet, but I believe you can. Yeah, like, I haven't tried to yet, so, um, because I've got a copy of X and Y available, so. Right. Um, I haven't actually tried to yet, so, but. But, I mean, they that have That was it. just something I was, I, I know once Pokebank comes out, if it ever comes out at this point. Right. I know that you can't transfer any items from it into the new games, which makes sense because the items are different now. Uh, items like experience share are different, so... Right. Let's talk about that real quick, the experience share. What, what did you think about those changes? Yeah, I like that. Um, I, well, it's one of those things I liked it and I didn't like it because it made it too easy to play the game. Basically, when all six of your Pokemon in party were gaining experience from battles... As minute as a difference as it is, I, I found it easier to, on a casual standpoint, I found it easier to actually, um, losing my train of thought here, I found it easier to, to keep them all the same level. Right. And, you know, in past games, your starter is normally like five to ten levels ahead of, of your other Pokemon, um, just because... You know, that first part of the game, you get up to almost uh, evolving your Pokemon before you can actually catch a Pokemon. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I did find it easier, especially from how early in the game that you got that item. Yeah. It was easier to keep everything pretty much balanced. Right. Well, one thing I did enjoy about it was it made it so at any single one time in the game, you could add something to your party, and in no time flat, it was the same level as everything else. Yeah, it would catch up. Uh, you know, like if, for instance, if you your team was level 50 and you're going through the back half of the game, and you decide, oh, hey, I want to add this Pokemon that I caught earlier. <clears throat> let's say, let, let's say Esper. Mm -hmm. That you caught from earlier in the game, you decide you want to use it late in the game. You add it to the party, it gains levels quicker because it's gaining that experience, the same amount of experience, to a point where it will eventually be the same level as what you have in your party. Right. So, I mean, to that respects, um, it, it, it made the made the change worth it, I think. Right. Well, it's for the casual gamer who just wants to play and beat the game and rinse and repeat. That that's a really great aspect to have in the game, and but to me, it almost felt like it made the game really, really easy to play. Because I mean, you didn't have to spend all that time individually raising Pokemon, throwing one to the front of the party, then the other, then the other, then the other. You just put your freaking beast mode Pokemon at the top of the list, walk a stomp a mud hole in the entire. <laughs> Freaking bless you. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you just stomp a mud hole in everything, and then, hey, all your Pokemon are cool. And yeah. like, I, like I said, that's not bad, but it left me to where if I ever play through it again, I'm going to turn it off. Oh, absolutely. And not because it's not, like I said, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not the way I enjoy playing the game. It doesn't, it was one of those things that was, the game was different and not the way it was. It lessened the excitement, I guess I can say. 
because it wasn't, now I have to get this Pokemon boosted up and do some grind and to get the levels up. It was, well, all I have to do is have my best Pokemon at the front of the party and everything else is going to get better anyways. Yeah, I'm going to run around in this patch of grass, murdering everything in it. Um, leave, leaving a body of po- you know bodies of Pokemon just laying about in this little patch of grass as I you know gain levels you know yeah I mean from a competitive standpoint too you want to gain that level quicker with with whatever Pokemon it is so if, by turning that off you can gain that you know gain the levels that you want quicker mm-hmm. um, now I will say um, Oh, you know what? I was thinking about a different game. Actually, never mind. I was thinking about the. I was thinking about White Two in, in the White in the Tree Hollow. Mm-hmm. I just enjoyed. I had, I just recalled with it. You know, I think this place really needs. A, I don't know if the Battle Miaison place, whatever that place is called. What is that? The battle. What is that? The battle. What the mansion? That, they got that mansion or whatever down there in in Kalodi City or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you gain experience with your Pokemon by going through there, right? I have no idea. I haven't been there. I've not, really, I've not really jumped into that yet, so I'll, know, I'll probably start with that just so that way we can talk about it a little more. I want to say no because I think that's pretty much like the battle. It's like a battle. You get battle points for going in there, I yeah, think. Yeah, but I don't think your Pokemon get experience. Okay. I mean, I could be wrong. Like I said, I was in there once just to see what items you could get there. And it reminds me just of the freaking Battle Frontier, where you go, you battle, you get battle points, and then you trade that in to get your crap. I'm sorry, nothing's ever going to be as cool as Emerald's Battle Frontier, though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ho and remakes, let's make them happen, people. Seriously, we need one. So, well, at this point, at this point, talking about the potential for Ho and remakes real quick... At this point, they're going to have to just to just to catch that generation of Pokemon up. Sure, mm-hmm. you can catch a lot of them, and sure, you can transfer a lot of them via the previous games and stuff. But really, you know, for the, for the gameplay, all they have to do. I mean, I'm sure it takes a lot uh, to to upscale the entire game from where it was to what we're playing now. Right. But it's almost a requirement at this point just so that we can get those Pokemon in these games together. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Kind, of, kind of like what they did with Leap Fire, Red, Leaf, Green. You know, they brought them out uh, after they did the Hoenn games. Um, mm-hmm. And then they did uh, Heart, Gold, and Soul, Silver at the end of... Uh, well, they did it right after Diamond and Pearl. And right. Pat. So, I mean... It's two generation of Pokemon games that they brought back. Just, you know, I mean, not only for for new people to play them, um, and and that's really, I mean, I mean, that's really where where Ruby Sapphire and Emerald are at right now. Is that there's a whole new audience out there that's never played these games that don't know what a Game Boy Advance is, and that's why I think that that's a big reason as to why I think they need to do the Hoenn remakes. But also, too, Pokemon like Groudon and Rayquaza and Kyogre, they're all harder to obtain Pokemon. And if you got them in your game, good, great, but I- I'm never going to see them in my game. Mm-hmm. You know, unless they put out these Hoenn remakes. Um, so that way we can trade between the games. Um, I-, I think it's due. Um, and, I- and one thing I, s- I noticed in X and Y... Um, um, didn't they bring back the dive ability? Yes. Well, that just that to me screams, "Hey, let's do a Hoenn remake." Because half of half of that game you spent underwater. Right. You know, I don't want to say half. I want to more like a fifth of that game. Right. There towards there towards the end when you're when you're running around Sutopolis and everything. Right. I mean, you're underwater quite a bit. So, but I know in Gen Four that they didn't have the dive ability. No, a, a lot of people were unhappy with that. They felt that's and don't get me wrong. Third gen is my all time favorite generation, but a lot of people and to this day when I say we need a third gen remake, people are like, "Oh, I didn't like third gen. You spent too much time on the water or under the water." That and is that, probably the one complaint I, probably the only complaint I have with with the Hoenn games. Right. 
You're but it's not – to me, it's not – I would rather be on the water beating the crap out of Tentacruel than running through caves beating the crap out of Geodudes and Zubats. It's just personal preference. Right. Well, yeah. So, I think we've gone all over the map with X and Y. So, one thing you've mentioned before that we're going to have as a weekly or a podcastly feature is our GTS jerk of the podcast. And it is Ricochet's esteemed honor to pick these out for you. You get on the GTS now, and uh, I understand the main purpose as to why you see these. Um, it is mostly just for cloning purposes. I, I know people to clone Pokemon. Um, <clears throat> what they do is, is they put these Pokemon on the GTS with these outlandish wants or needs knowing that this Pokemon will never get traded so that way they can turn about and clone that Pokemon. Um, I get it. Some, you know, gives you, instead of having that one perfect iv Charizard, that shiny, you now got six of them. And you can use that for trading purposes. And that's, I mean, you check Twitter and, and you, you follow as many people as I do on Twitter. I mean, I, I don't follow that many people, but probably I, I follow 106 people on Twitter. I would probably say about 35% of that are different Pokemon pages offering up crazy shiny trades. Almost all the time you, I see a, a shiny trade of some sort or a, le, or a legendary. And the reason that these trades are happening is because they cloned them, or they had somebody clone these Pokemon for them. And pretty much getting off topic, you know, they're cloning, they clone these Pokemon to do these random trades as giveaways, which is cool. You know, you know, keep doing it, Pokemon community. It's whatever to me. Um, so, but I, you know, you get on GTS, I know you were telling me, uh, you know, just the outlandish crap that people want for, for a Pichu. You said you were looking for, for a good Pichu. Yep. Um, uh, I, I know I, I check Eevee quite often. Uh, Esper, Meowstic, uh, I've been checking a lot lately. And uh, so I decided, since we decided to do our own podcast, to do a GTS Jerk of the Week. And uh, this week's... Um, the inaugural jerk of the week uh, is going to be Xander from West Virginia, USA. Uh, Xander, <laughs> Xander has a level 14 Zubat out on uh, the GTS right now. Xander, if you're listening, you are the jerk of the week because for, for two reasons here. A, you're asking for a Hoopa. Uh, Hoopa is an unannounced legendary Pokemon. To our knowledge, I say this because it is unannounced. Uh, there were images that shot out shortly after uh, the game released of this particular Pokemon in game. The reason that it, it was obviously hacked. Some somebody hacked the game, found this Pokemon, and I don't know if Xander either a hacked his game to find one or battled somebody who had one in their party. Either way, you either hacked your game or you fought somebody who hacked your game and decided that you were going to put a level 14 Zubat on GTS for this particular Pokemon. That doesn't exist really to most anyone else yet, unless you're a hacker. So for that, you are the inaugural GTS Jerk of the Week, Xander. Congratulations. Uh, if you ever listen to this, um, send us some hate. I don't care. You know, I, I would love to tell you why you're a jerk. Uh, or why you were uh, the GTS jerk of the week. Plain and simple. And there's, I, kn I know there's plenty of other people out there, and, and I will pick out another outlandish one uh, for next week's podcast. So I'll, I'll find something that is just out of this world crazy. Why would somebody do that? And uh, 
and, and I'll keep it in game. So Hoopa, I just saw Hoopa and, and got you know instantly saw red because it's not an announced legendary. Um, so I mean, just the fact that he even picked that Pokemon as the Pokemon he wanted to trade a level 14 Zubat for, I saw red. So that's why he's the inaugural one next week. I will keep it in game. I will pick something that you can obtain in game, and I will find someone on the GTS who is trying to trade that for something outlandish that you could also get in-game. So, that is the GTS Jerk of the Week. Awesome. Okay, um, another feature we're going to have is a type of the week, uh, Pokemon type of the week, and since there's, what is there, 17 types now? There are, thanks to the fairy type that everybody was so blatantly pissed about. And we didn't even mention that when we went over initial X and initial, Y. Initial thoughts of X and Y. Honestly, it doesn't change the game too much for me. I mean, the fairy the, type that is right. The most it changes is a competitive outlook on the game because of the most. Dragon, r- is, Dragon is no longer completely overpowering. Right. So, I mean, to me, it just asked me now to use types that I would have normally used, like steel or poison to crush the fairy types, which mm-hmm. is fine by me. <laughs> so to me, it, to me, the reason I never mentioned it as we were going over our initial gameplay thoughts is because to me it didn't change it enough for me to, to, to say, hey, this was a – I mean, obviously it was a big deal uh, to most people, but for me it wasn't that big of a deal because it just asked us to use different types of Pokemon. Right. It obviously wasn't that big of a deal because it slipped both our minds until just now. Right. But so, but yes, seventeen types of Pokemon. Yes, um, I and believe we uh, throwing out there earlier, talking before jumping into the podcast. We both decided on the electric type. Yes, uh, because it came to both of our minds as far as the type of the week. And electric type is actually my all-time favorite in-game type. It has been my favorite type of the game ever since I've played. Uh, Red and blue. I actually started with blue, just for clarification. And um, I've just always really, really liked the electric types. I've always had a favorite electric type Pokemon of every gen, and it's just been there. So we're picking the electric type Pokemon as our spotlight type of the week or podcast, and we're just going to throw out a couple of our favorite electric type Pokemon, name some of maybe the unique sets we've ever used on them, or some of the just absurd sets we've ever used on them. And I'll go first. My all-time favorite electric type Pokemon comes from Gen 1 and stems from the mascot of the game, which unfortunately is Pikachu. (laughs) <laughs> but my favorite is Raichu. It's been my favorite since the very first gen. I always had one on my team when I was playing in game. If you could get one, it pissed me off to no end that you couldn't evolve Pikachu in Pokemon Yellow. But at the same time, I enjoyed it because I didn't have to spend a year and a half in Viridian Forest trying to find one in the tall grass. But Raichu... One of the most unique sets that I've ever used on a Raichu, competitively speaking, and this is going all the way back to 4th Gen, which was, oh, good lord, before there was an RU tier, which everything was just NU then, and Raichu was way, way down there, and I had uh, an adamant nature on it with Substitute, oh, crap. What's the speed? What's the speed berry? Salic berry? No, that's attack. No, um, that's I, speed. I'll be honest. I don't use berries as much as I probably should in game. But it had the speed boosting berry. I think it's the sub salic set. I think was that. So we'll go with that. It was the sub salic set? Adamant nature. I had thunder punch. Oh crap! What's the fighting? What is it? Oh. God, I'm not even going to be able to remember it. Focus it's not punch? No. No, it's not revenge. It's it's the one that bases off your reversal. Okay. It's based off of how many hit points you have left. I had reversal, I had 
Oh, balls. Endeavor, the normal type attack that also is based off of your low hit points. I had the hit points set up to where I could switch in. Uh, an important part of this set was a spinner on the team to spin away entry hazards before he came in. Switch into something get that would have to switch out against Raichu, set up a sub, keep subbing down until I was down to one hit point left which would activate my berry, which would make me faster than hopefully whatever I was facing, and just freaking pop off either Thunder Punch, Reversals, or Endeavors. And that was, and shall be, my favorite Raichu set. Screw Volt Tackle, screw the special sets. I mean, there's been Volt some tackle, interest... Volt Tackle is too much of a pain to breed into the Pikachu line. Just well, throwing that out. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, especially now because it's almost impossible to find a light ball. Which yeah, actually, going back to something I mentioned earlier, my current breed project is a volt tackling Pichu, but I can't do that until I find a light, a light ball, which I haven't come across yet. But I do have a friend whose friend Safari has Pikachu in it. So hopefully I come across one of those when, within the next 50 I catch. Nice. So what is your favorite Electric-type Pokemon? Um, I've got two, but I think I'm going to settle on just doing the one. Uh, I'm going to pick... I'm going with Electivire. Okay. Um, I have loved this guy since I have seen him. Um... The first time I ever saw him, you know, I got online instantly, found a Japanese figure, ordered it. I've got it sitting on my headboard uh, above where I lay my head at night. Um, like I said, probably one of my favorite Pokemon, uh, easily my favorite electric Pokemon, Electivire. Um, getting right down to it, Electivire uh, has two abilities, Motor Drive, and um, I believe his hidden ability is Vital Spirit. Mm. Um both of them are kind of eh. Uh, motor drive is definitely more the way that you want to go with them. Uh, that way, you know, you can use them to switch into electric type attacks. Um, he gets hit with that, and, and his speed uh, boosts up by uh, one and a half stages, I believe, when, when hit by an electric type attack. So. Mm. Um, so that, that gives him uh, crazy speed. You want to use him as a physical attacker. Um, I, I don't see too many electric, or I don't see too many uh, Electivire sets that, that are modest. I mean, you can use them as modest. Um, see, I used to run a mix set. Yeah, that's that's you can you can do mix sets with him too. He's got a really good move pool. Oh, physical. he sure does. Uh, both physical and uh, special attack. Um, really good move pool, so you can do a mix set. So um, I've always been a fan of. I've always been a fan of the uh, the physical sets. Um, you get uh, you can get ice punch, uh, you can get fire punch on him. Um, so, but uh, probably the best set uh, that's out there. You could either run Jolly Nature for special uh, speed up, special attack down, or you could do Adamant Nature, uh, which we all know is attack up, special attack down. Um, you can either run him. You could run him one of three ways as far as items go. You could do a Choice Band, uh, a Choice Scarf, or Life Orb. Um, so, but the set is Wild Charge, Cross Chop, Earthquake, and Ice Punch. Um, one of my favorite sets. Um, I believe they, they even offered this particular set out as a Pokemon Battle Revolution giveaway. I think you had that game. I uh, think for the, I... for the Wii. Um, they gave him out as a special giveaway, him and Magmortar both. I think he had Thunder Punch, because I don't think he had Wild Charge back in It might have been, yeah, Battle it might have been... Might have been Thunder Punch instead of Wild Charge. I know he had Ice Punch, and I know he had Cross Chop and Earthquake as well. Right. Um, so Wild Charge, it's, I think Wild Charge was actually introduced 5th Gen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a good physical move for him. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, there's there's other move sets. You can get you can do a mix set. Um, 
either Wild Charger, Thunderbolt. You could do Earthquake. Uh, Earthquake's just it, it's just a powerful move, and when when you got a physical attacker, um, it's hard not you know if he can learn it, it's hard not to put it on him. Mm-hmm. Um, you could do uh, Flamethrower, um, Ice Punch. Um, they say Hidden Power Grass, but I I just I have issues telling anybody to use Hidden Power now with with the Gen Six nerf. Right. Well, so they they completely killed Hidden Power with Six Gen, so it's hard for me to say use Hidden Power. Right. Well, they used to say to use Hidden Power Grass used to be really useful because when Evire was ex, was really popular in Fourth Gen. Right. Friggin' Swamper was all over his business. Yeah. It was everywhere. Being, being the water ground type, the ground nerfed his uh, electrical Right, abilities. and nothing else one hit KO'd it unless you had Hidden Power Grass. Yeah. And normally, an Electivire should be quicker than Swampert, so... Yeah, back in back in 4th Gen when Electivire first hit the scene, uh, Swampert and uh, Gastrodon yeah. both, uh, both put a hurt on Electivires, so the Hidden Power Grass was to... Uh, Pretty much alleviate that pain, right? So, but that's uh, that. That's my pick. That's one of my favorite electric types of all time. I've got a nice adamant natured one in my Pokemon White Two game that I am patiently waiting for Pokebank to come out so I can trade it over. <laughs> right. So that would be our Pokemon type of the week in our picks for that typing. So. Yeah. So we're right around the hour mark, and I think we will call that a podcast. Uh, it's a good initial start. I like it. So, so if you have any questions, comments, things you would like us to discuss in the podcast about Pokemon, either future, past, or present, if there's anything you want to know about us personally, what's our favorite Pokemon, what's our favorite gen, which I've already named, things of that nature that we can go over in the podcast so you guys get a better feel for us and we can get a better feel for you as viewers, be Listeners. more than happy to either A, tweet us about it, or uh, this is going to end up on my YouTube channel, leave it in the comments, etc., etc. I will et cetera, also be putting it on cetera. my YouTube channel, so... Uh... So there will be... All kinds of massive links in this. So look forward to that. Give us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. What can we do to improve? Because we're doing this for you, the listener. Or uh, as we call them, toga peeps. Uh, the toga peeps, that's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right, guys. We're going to call it a podcast. This has been Tup Tuppleton and Ricochet signing off. Catch on the flip side, guys. Peace out. See you next week.